Packers. It's good to be with you all here in the room, as well as those of you who are joining us online. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Um, we, today we're in week two of a conversation we began last week, which is why it's week two. I know I say that all the time, and I don't realize it until I'm in the middle of saying it. So we're in a week two of a conversation called Superheroes. And uh, I'm really excited about this sermon series. If you missed out last weekend, I'd love for you to go back. And, and last week we had an exciting celebration on 4th of July weekend. Um, but I started by telling you a little bit about what inspired these, uh, the sermon series. And it was when I was spending time and praying, thinking about all the different things that I was going through in the coronavirus, I thought of three questions that, that God kind of prompted in me. Here they are. Where is hope? Where is God at work? And what am I thankful for? And there was something about just the nudging of God that started making me think about those things for me. And uh, those are good questions anytime, but especially during difficult times, especially um, during times when you're kind of stressed. Those are questions about where do you see the kingdom of God at work, especially when we're looking at a broken world. And uh, last Sunday we talked about, I, we kind of see God working, or at least I see him, hopefully you all did too, through our uh, essential workers. People that Paul said should be honored, even though we aren't always mindful in thinking about them. So we celebrated them. Hopefully you gave out some stickers. I saw several sticker posts. If you didn't, there's more stickers in the lobby. You can love stickers. Doesn't everybody love stickers? Uh, I put one on my car to support superheroes, but I gave several out this week, and uh, that was really neat. So um, this week, I want to talk about a couple different superheroes, and these are two of my personal superheroes, um, Regina Guthrie and Marianne Moyers. Let's give them a hand. All right. Give them a hand if you're online. Now, if you know Regina and Marianne, you know they hate that I just did that. So I will have to ask for forgiveness later. Um, but here's why they're superheroes to me. About four years ago, they came into my office and said, we have an idea. We have a dream. We have a vision. And uh, they wanted to start a ecumenical, which means many church, uh, southeast Missouri mission called Spread Hope Now. And um, I was thinking back about this conversation last week because I don't remember, it's been four years, and I don't remember exactly what we were thinking about back then. I know at least one of the initial things was we had some people that wanted to donate furniture. They were like downsizing their house and they wanted to donate furniture to people starting over from fire, starting over um, like domestic violence, that type of thing. And so we rented like a storage unit and had some furniture there. I think we even stored some in the classrooms here at the church for a little bit. Um, I don't remember exactly what else was involved, but I do remember kind of their vision. And their vision was um, you all here at First UMC, those here in the room, those worshiping online, you all here at First UMC do a phenomenal job reaching out uh, to Southeast Missouri Missions. You all have for a number of years. I'm so honored to be one of your pastors. But we really believe that, that reaching out in missions isn't simply a First United Methodist thing. It's a Jesus thing. And so we do these big events uh, like Radical Christmas or School Fest or Feed My Starving Children. We do these big events, but we're trying to think about how can it not be only a First United Methodist thing how can we as an act of love help other churches feel fully included? That the kingdom of God isn't Methodist, that it's all Christians. And so by creating Spread Hope now as, as a partner ministry, but a little bit different, it would allow other churches to feel fully concluded and participated. Now, here's why this is so cool to me. Um, because Marion and Regina when they're starting Spread Hope now, they didn't have, well, let me just say, they're incredibly wonderful, ordinary women of faith. And, and I know if I said that, like some people are like, don't call her ordinary, don't call them ordinary. They're exceptional, and they are. They're superheroes. 
But what I mean by that is they don't have like formal mission degrees. They don't have a degree in social work. They don't have some master plan they inherited from another nationwide organization. Really when they, we started this, when they helped start Spread Hope Now, they had two things. They had the call of God and they had a willingness to say yes. And what they saw then, what we see today, is that oftentimes God's greatest work is through pretty ordinary people that are willing to say yes to God's call, willing to follow God's call. In fact, if you look at the scriptures, most of God's greatest work in scriptures are through relatively ordinary people. Now, Looking back now, we're like, oh my gosh, they're amazing. But, but if you look at their lives, they were really ordinary people that were willing to say yes to God's call. For example, some of you know Christianity was birthed out of Judaism. In the beginning of Judaism, do you remember who it started with? Anybody? Abraham. Somebody said it. Abraham. Did you know that when God called Abraham, Abraham didn't even believe in God, didn't even know God existed. Abraham was when God called Abraham and said, Hey, Abraham, I want you to take Sarah, and I want you to, to go to a land that I'm going to uh, show you. It's not that they were extraordinary. They were simply willing to say yes to God's call. Moses Moses, there was nothing extraordinary. In fact, he had several things working against him. Moses didn't know how to lead an entire nation. And yet, Moses was willing to say yes to follow God's call. I think about Samuel. Samuel was literally a a young boy when God called him. And he had no idea how to choose a king. He had no idea. He was just willing to say yes. Yes, to God's call. What about, think about this. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was about as ordinary. I don't mean that to disrespect her because we celebrate her faith. But Mary was just a young teenage girl engaged to a regular ordinary guy named Joseph. And yet what makes them exceptional is simply their willingness to say yes to God's call. And we could go on and on and on. I could spend all day just looking at example after example. But the point I want to make is it's not what any of them knew. It's what they were willing to do that made them extraordinary. And I'm convinced That God's preferred way to work in the world is through ordinary people who are willing to say yes to God's call. So, two months ago, whenever I started thinking about those three questions I mentioned earlier, where is hope, where do I see God at work, what am I thankful for? The first question, when that came to mind, you know my first reaction, where do I see hope? Well, at the corner of Kings Highway and Murray Lake. Anybody know where it is? What, what's there? Spread hope now. By the way, whenever I first heard, when they finally got a building, when they heard they're like telling me where the building was, and they said the old uh, mall, the old fisherman's net. I'm new. I don't know where the old. This shows you how long I've been sightseeing, because I almost said, do you know where that is? That's the old mall. Like, that doesn't help if you're new. But, but it's at the corner of Kings Highway and Murray Lane. And and I started thinking that's where hope is. But in a broader sense, hope is anywhere where we are willing to share God's love to people who are desperately in need. And so in thinking about that, I was led to a scripture that we're going to read today. It comes from, this is a book kind of towards the end of the Bible. This is written by Jesus' younger brother. Think about what that would be like to be Jesus' younger brother, to grow up in Jesus' shadows. Um, So James is his name. James didn't even believe that Jesus was son of God while he was doing ministry. He didn't believe Jesus was the son of God until he saw his older brother killed. He saw his older brother buried. He saw his older brother resurrected from the dead. And he saw his older brother go up into heaven. Then... 
James says, all right, I'll believe it. <laughs> like, you know, it's hard to dispute it then. And so James not only becomes a Jesus follower, James becomes one of the leaders for the church in Jerusalem. And while James was never one of Jesus' disciples, James watched Jesus for much longer than disciples did, right? James grew up watching his older brother, listening, observing, and noticing. And years later, after the resurrection, James wrote a letter to other people, to other people, letting them know what it means to believe, to have faith, that his brother Jesus is the Son of God. Now, this is one of my very favorite books in the Bible. If you haven't read it, go home and read it this week. It's not very long. You can read it in a, a, just a couple days. You can read it, read it in one day. I almost just got up here and just read the book of James as my sermon. It really is that good. Um, it's also that uncomfortable. <laughs> but I, instead, I chose just one section. This is from James 2 starting in verse 14, that I think highlights what James is saying about what it means to have faith in Jesus. So I want you to hear these words. James 2, 14. My brothers and sisters, which is funny, by the way, brothers and sisters, because he, his brother is Jesus. And now he's saying, all right, y'all, anybody who wants to is invited into the family. All right, your brother and sister of mine, because, and then your brother and sister of Jesus, right? Because we're all one family. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith, but do nothing to show it? Now, what James begins by saying is it is great to come to church, but coming to church, whether you're here in person, here online, I want to thank you for being here, but that is not faith. Singing songs is great. We had some beautiful music. But that is not faith. Um, what you post on social media, I hope you'll share worship. I hope you'll share things about the church on social media. But what you post on social media, that is not faith. What t-shirt you wear. I love my Spread Hope Not t-shirt. Um, I saw several other Feed My Starving Children shirts. and They're great. I hope you'll wear those. But that is not faith. What is faith? It's how you live. It's what you do. Let's, he gives a very specific example. Let's continue. Claiming to have faith can't save anybody. Just saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. It can't save anybody. Imagine a brother, and he gives an example. Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and has never had enough food to eat. Imagine that. Can you, can you picture that? You know what I picture is uh, a person I remember seeing not too long ago on the street with a sign for food. That's who I'm thinking of. I can think of other people. Maybe you all. So imagine somebody who doesn't have enough food to eat. Now what if one of you said, hey, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal. Have you ever done that? I mean, maybe not those exact words, but like you see somebody in need, you're like, hey, bless you. That's what he's talking about here. And I have done that. Unfortunately, I say that confessionally. I'm guessing I'm not the only one. He said, if you say, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal, what good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. This is the word of God for all of God's creation. Thanks be to God. Notice what James is saying is regardless of what you say, if you're not willing to help people in need, your, your faith is on life support, right? If, if you, when you see somebody who's hurting, hungry, homeless, if your heart isn't moved, then your faith isn't really alive, regardless of what you say. And in fact, there's two different ways to interpret this. One is that it can be interpreted as reflective. It can be interpreted as like your spiritual temperature right now. You know, every week um, since we've been back together, we have um, a little thermometer here. We have a traditions and we have it at First Kids. Everybody singing, me, everybody speaking, we do a thermometer test. Why do we do that? 
to make sure we're healthy before we get up and speak at you, right? And and so we do that to test our temperature. What James is saying is if you want to take a temperature of your faith, that how you treat people who are hurting, hungry, and homeless reflects your spiritual condition. If you see people holding a sign, if you see people who are in need, if you see people who are hurting, and if you uh, think negative thoughts about them, if you say negative things about them, if you make sarcastic comments, if you make jokes at their expense, if you belittle them, if you harass them, if you do anything other than have compassion and help and pray and care for them, then faith isn't alive, it's dead. That's what you can tell what's in your heart by how you live to hurting people. This is Jesus' brother James who's saying this, by the way, right? So one sense, he can say it's reflective of your spiritual temperature. The other way to interpret this is it's also predictive of your spiritual life. If, you know, whenever I take my temperature, I can tell how healthy I am right now. But if I want to remain healthy, if I want to stay healthy, what do I need to do? I need to like wash my hands and eat healthy and get sleep and exercise and do all those annoying things that we know we should do but we don't really want to, right? James is saying, if you want your spiritual life to be healthy, you need to help people who are hurting. That there's something about the act uh, of helping hurting, hungry, homeless people that changes what's inside your heart. And you know this, right? I know this. I had a friend recently that told told me, or they didn't even tell me, I stumbled across it. Um, Something they did that was like one of those, wow, you did that? I mean, this was really just an amazing act of care and love. And I I said, this is awesome. And they said, eh, it's no big deal. And besides Pastor Mike, I got so much more out of it. It was so good for my soul. And I want you to hear this. I'm not going to share their story because they didn't want me to share their story. But I want you to hear this. It was really a big deal. I'm like any of it. If I told you, you'd be like, what? That's amazing. But they did it. You want to know why they did it? They did it because these people are people with faith that's alive. And what they told me is by helping in this way, their faith became alive in in a deeper way. And we see this over, I see this every time I go on a mission trip. Every time I go on a mission trip, I say, wow, God. And I fall in love with God all over again. Every time I help at one of our community mission events, um, every time I help at something like School Fest, which is August 15th, super amazing. I don't, the School Fest, Feed My Starving Children, those events get on my calendar quick because I don't want to miss out. Do you want to know why I don't want to miss out? Because I want my heart, I want my faith to become alive. And whenever I do those, I experience my faith in a deeper way. I hear it every single time somebody comes up and says, man, this was so good for my soul. Now, conversely, I can't tell you how many times I talk with people and say, how is your soul? And they say, man, I'm going through a rough time. I don't feel close to God. I feel distant. And one of the things I ask them, when was the last time You served in some sort of mission. When was the last time you gave generously, not to your kids, not to a family member, not to, but gave generously to help somebody in need? Because that will change your spiritual heart. That's what James is saying. And by the way, James is not only saying this for Mike. James is not only saying this for you. James is telling this to the church, to churches. Every single alive church I know does this extraordinarily well. In fact, to the extent that they help hurting people is directly connected to the spiritual health of a church. And churches that that don't do it, I can just tell you it's a matter of time before they're going to close their doors. This is part of the reason that I believe we do missions is because this church, you all are so spiritually alive and you do so many wonderful things. But I can promise you, the moment we stop caring about hurting homeless, hungry people, the moment we stop caring about people in need, it's a moment where we lose the Holy Spirit moving. 
This is a predictor of spiritual health, not only in our life, but also in the life of the church. Now I want to add one more thing. Whenever we talk about activities and missions, I talk about Spread Hope Now because this is our signature partner mission uh, organization here to make an impact in Southeast Missouri. But if you've been here very long, you've probably heard us talk about our sister church in Mukukane, Mozambique. Men and women, boys and girls that do a phenomenal job and we send mission teams there and we support them and they pray for us and they support us and it's a beautiful act of mission. And some of you know that just uh, about, we should have been in the Dominican last week, two weeks ago. Uh, this year COVID interrupted that but we send mission teams to our partner ministry in the Dominican Republic. And some of you know every single week we send men and women to read at the kindergarten center. And some of you know that we have United Methodist women and United Methodist men that, that are passionate about our work and missions. And some of you know that we have an emergency assistance fund where we give out over $20,000 to people in crisis and need every single year. And a part of you know that a portion of your offering every single Sunday goes to help the worldwide United Methodist churches work all around the world. And some of you know that not only are there things that we do as a church, but there's things that you all do as individuals, right? Some of you work at, at the Bulldog Pantry or take food over there. Some of you help out at Walk Beside Me or House of Refuge or what else am I forgetting? You can text online, that's good. Ghost, crickets. There's all sorts of ways, though, that we are helping people. Why? Because we are spiritually alive and we want to continue to let our faith become alive. Now I want to tell you one more story. If you have socks, grab them because they might get blown off. I'm talking to you. That's right. Me. Um, no, this is so cool. Seriously. About a year ago... Regina and Marianne came into my office. Maybe it's just Marianne. Uh, we visited, and we were praying about Radical Christmas. And uh, the idea came up. Um, in the past, we've always given a lot of different things away during Christmas, not only this church, but churches around our community. Um, but one of the big things that people kind of notice is we like giving toys, right? Who doesn't like toys? We also know that there's a lot of different groups in our community, several that give out toys at Christmas, which is awesome. But there was someone that just felt the nudge and said, what if instead of giving out toys this Christmas, we took a Christmas offering, we collected, by the way, this last August, $17,500 plus, dollars, and we set it aside and said, what if we took that money and we bought cleaning supplies, <laughs> and personal hygiene items, and toilet paper, and paper towels, and hand sanitizers, all that sort of stuff. And what if we give them out, because if you're uh, living in a small place, you may not have, like, space to store the same size. And so what if we gave the vouchers out each month, and every single month, we would give out these items to 100 families in our community. And so we started what now we call Mission 100. In fact, we did it yesterday, right? What a great opportunity. Every month, we give uh, personal hygiene items, cleaning supplies, household items to help 100 families in our community. And we did that. We collected on, on, uh, during Radical Christmas, and we gave out uh, stuff in January, and we gave out stuff in February. And I think we gave out stuff at the beginning of March, but do you remember what happened in the middle of March? More specifically, do you remember going to the store March, April, May? What wasn't on the shelf? Toilet paper and hand sanitizer and bleach and cleaning supplies and some personal hygiene items. You know, the stores were barren. Do you know who had toilet paper and hand sanitizer? And cleaning supplies? Do you know who had it? Spread Hope Now. Mission 100. We had it when other people didn't. Isn't that cool? Why? There's a story in Exodus uh, 41 where God gives Joseph a dream. 
He said, there's about to be a famine, and so we want you to store up uh, grain to last during the famine. Everybody thought it was crazy. Everybody thought it was ridiculous. But, but Joseph organized Egypt to store up all this grain. Guess what happened? Famine. We had a, a vision last summer to about radical Christmas about how to change it, and there were all sorts of reasons not to do it. It's not as fun, and people might not be as involved, and, and we love giving toys, and I don't know, it's not what we've always done. And there's all sorts of reasons, but there's one reason, actually two reasons we heard to do it. Number one, we heard the voice of God, and number two, it was a loving thing to do. And so we made a radical choice. And because of that, during the great uh, toilet paper famine of 2020, a hundred families that might not have had it otherwise did. And that's because of you all. That's because of ordinary people, ordinary churches, who are listening for the voice of God and willing to follow, willing to say yes, regardless of everything else. And friends, whenever I think about superheroes, I think sometimes we think of superheroes as people with extraordinary strength or people that can fly or... This is my superhero. Anybody else do this? Remember this? As a kid, jumping around on the the couches. Anybody else? Am I the only one? This is what I think of with superheroes. But you know, real life superheroes don't wear capes. What do they do? Real life superheroes are ordinary people who are willing to say yes to God's call and allow God to work through them in extraordinary ways. And that's not them, that's not Clark Kent, that's you, that's me. That's who God calls us to be. I am a I do call Marion and Regina superheroes and so many others involved in Spread Hope Now, so many others involved in missions, so many others. But the two things that are consistent is they have the voice of God and they have the courage to say yes, even when it's uncomfortable. And James says that is living faith. It rarely begins with extraordinary people. It's about ordinary people that God is using in extraordinary ways. So here's my question to leave you with. How do you show faith through your actions? Who have you spread hope to recently? How have you seen God working through you to help somebody in need? Those questions measure your spiritual life, but they also can predict your spiritual life. So I hope you'll wrestle with them. Let me pray. God, I thank you for all the ways that you're working in us and through us. And God, I thank you for our partner ministry, Spread Hope Now, and the great things they're doing. But I thank you for so many other ordinary ways that you're using men and women of faith. And we don't want to do it for ourselves. We want to do it to reflect your love. We want to do it because we love you, because we trust you, and we want you to grow deeper in our hearts and lives. God, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for the miracle of the... I just praise you for the miracle of the toilet paper famine this year. And I thank you for so many other ways you're at work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, Oh.